Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California, Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. Are you an employer looking to interview some of the best tax talent at the top law schools in the country? If so, then you'll want to check out the Tax Attorney Recruiting Event, or TARE, the largest event of its kind. The event is being held virtually on Thursday, February 24th, 2022, and brings together more than 150 graduate students from the LLM in Taxation programs at Boston University School of Law, the University of Florida Levin College of Law, Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, and University of California Irvine School of Law. Participating employers will have the opportunity to pre-screen applications and select candidates with whom they wish to interview. Employers may participate by interviewing students virtually during TARE or by collecting resumes from participating students. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Go to the-tare.com and click on the employer registration link. That's the-tare.com. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, breaking down NFTs. As cryptocurrency has risen in popularity, it's paved the way for other digital assets, such as non-fungible tokens, or NFTs. You'll hear a more thorough definition of NFTs in the upcoming interview, but essentially, an NFT is a digital file that's uniquely identifiable via blockchain. This new asset has many in the tax world wondering about its implications and its consequences, especially with the million-dollar sales of some recent NFTs. So what do potential owners, investors, and tax preparers need to be aware of? Here to talk more about this is Tax Notes contributing editor, Carrie Brandon Elliott. Carrie, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, David. It's good to be here again. Now, you recently spoke with someone about NFT compliance issues. Could you tell us about your guest and what you talked about? I spoke with Max Dillendorf of the Dillendorf Law Firm in New York City. They have several practice areas that include digital assets and tax planning. Specifically, Their practice areas include advising clients that want to launch and trade NFTs and who need tax planning and compliance around cryptocurrency issues. So Max and I discussed how they advise clients on structuring transactions and digital assets from a tax planning and compliance viewpoint. And we also touched on bank secrecy, anti-money laundering, and know your customer aspects of these transactions. All right, let's go to that interview. Hi, Max. Welcome to the podcast. We're here today to talk about non-fungible tokens or NFTs. So let's get started. Max, can you just take a few moments to sort of describe or define a non-fungible token or NFT? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on on your show. The the way to describe NFTs, uh, let's think of them as unique digital art that cannot be uh, copied or reproduced non-fungible so one of a kind right and that you know one of a kind is uh is facilitated by the virtue of the fact that it's, it's being stored in a blockchain so anyone at any given point of time can you know look your digital art and and, and confirm that you are a true owner of that art by the virtue of, of, of a digital you know digital signature and, and digital ledger that everyone gets to see so I understand there's a market for these. That's right. There's a huge market for those for those digital, uh, you know, paintings, uh, prints, whatever you call that. So we understand that you can create the art, you can buy an NFT, or you can sell an NFT. Can you briefly describe sort of how some of these transactions work? Sure, we can. I guess uh, look at this market from from different perspectives. There are people that created, so the artists. There are people that actively engaged in these transactions as as buyers and sellers. Then there are promoters of digital art. There are multiple platforms that that facilitate the the sale of digital art, uh, both in the U.S. and and globally. And and there is an up upward trend uh, in terms of how fast this market growth and and develops and 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 we see that the uh, you know the the, the value of uh, sales value is is just skyrocketing. So so can you talk a little bit about the intersection between NFTs and say the blockchain and cryptocurrency? The intersection, well, in order for someone to to be able 
to purchase or sell, sell uh, an NFT, you know, the person needs to be familiar with, with what a cryptocurrency is, right? They need to they need to have certain devices and and wallets to connect to those uh, marketplaces to exchange their cryptocurrency for any given NFT token that they like. So uh, the most commonly used wallet in the ecosystem is called Meta, MetaMask wallet, right? So it's a digital wallet that that stores different types of crypto your you know your bitcoin your ethereum no it's actually erc20 so it, it stores the erc20 tokens like ethereum so you can connect that wallet to uh to a gallery or you, know, you can connect that wallet to uh, any given uh marketplace the trades nfts and make an exchange so pretty much you you're exchanging your cryptocurrency uh, either Ethereum or stablecoin for, for for the selected piece of art. So the intersection is that someone needs to know what a crypto is, how to buy it, how to manage it, how to store it on a wallet, like how to uh, you know obtain sort of rights and 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 safe keep uh, the uh, the NFT that they just purchased. How would you advise a client sort of on the tax consequences of say a sale of an NFT? Well, you know the uh, the IRS they they see each cryptocurrency as as a property, right? So uh, NFT is not is not a legal is not a legal term or a tax term. So it's 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 a digital token, and uh, according to the tax rules, like hey, if you are trading one type of cryptocurrency for another, every time you complete the transaction, you either have a gain or a loss. So, so if you're trading NFTs, which are digital tokens, then every time you have a taxable transaction to, to report. What about creators and sellers of NFTs? I understand that you may have gain or loss on the cryptocurrency aspects of the transaction. Is that separate from the transaction in the NFT itself, whether you're buying or selling or creating? Well, the selling goods. I mean, they they pretty much. If, if you're dealing with an artist who just uh, created, let's say, ten thousand NFTs, so the question is like, okay, what are you really selling? Are you you're selling a product, right? So you you spend, let's say, ten thousand dollars on on marketing fees. You you spend, you know, fifteen thousand dollars on on a digital digital the virtual designer to come up with these elephants or penguins so like you are already out of pocket twenty five thousand dollars and and you generated the profit of i don't know seventy five thousand dollars right so you would probably report it as as an ordinary income but then the question is like okay well what about what about a buyer a buyer who purchased uh, any given nft for a thousand dollars and now three months later, he finds out that this NFT is like so unique that it's worth, you know, $300,000, right? And he wants to sell it. And so upon realizing uh, and completing the sale, there'll be, uh, there'll be a significant gain, right? Between, between what, what it was purchased for and, and between what the seller is selling it for. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California, Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. Ranked number one on the West Coast and number five nationwide, this innovative program prepares students to practice tax law at the highest level in the U.S. and abroad. Featuring a low student-to-faculty ratio, cutting-edge technology instruction, and dedicated career support, UCI's Graduate Tax Program helps prepare students for a future in tax law. Program graduates are placed in top tax-related industries practicing law in many major U.S. cities. Applications are open now. For more information and to apply to this highly selective program, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. So in terms of being able to say, do a transaction in an NFT and then actually you know, pay a tax liability, can you talk a little bit about some of the uh, questions that clients have when it comes to that piece of it, like banking rules, for example? Well, I think the biggest trap the clients, you know, are not really realizing that every time they exchange one NFT for another, it's it's a reportable, 
tax transaction, right? So you may be either generating loss or profit. So clients need to new clients need to keep track of all, all of their trading activities, right? And there are some people out there that can be buying or selling, you know, like 20, 30, 50 NFTs per day. And they could be sort of using their Ethereum to complete a transaction. So we would need to know like, hey, what was the cost basis of, of that Ethereum at the time when you changed it to understand if you generated loss or you generated profit. So the, the, your records must be immaculate so that you have a clean picture in the end of the year. So do you find that the reporting itself, like the tax forms and sort of the IRS rules, are they up to task for this particular market? Or are there things that could be done to improve the ability of people who deal in NFTs to remain compliant? Well, we, we work with CPAs who are knowledgeable in, in crypto and crypto reporting, but in the end of the day, it, it, it's still like it's sitting down and going through every transaction that, that a client completed, really understanding what type of digital assets uh, the client has in, in his wallet when they purchased it, what's the original cost basis of that asset. So at the time when the transfer or the sale occurred, how do we calculate you know, the, the tax basis and the new piece. So there, there's a lot of uh, like micro uh, analysis that goes there. And as far as, as far as softwares that keep track of everything, you know, unfortunately, even in, in 2022, like there is no like a solid uh, software solution that can, that can take care of all of these uh, nuances. So oftentimes it's, it's a lot of manual work. Mm, that's interesting. Do you have any thoughts on, say, the banking aspects of this, what the banks are doing? Well, we certainly have a lot of thoughts on, on what the banks are doing. Well, the banks are a subject to the so-called you know, Bank Secrecy Act, right? And know your customer uh, rules, as well as anti-money laundering rules. So whenever there is an interaction between a customer and a bank, you know, your bank wants to know that, hey, like this, this person for whom we opened the bank account, he is, he, he's not, he's not doing something uh, uh, illegal, right? So because because if he does, we can get in trouble. So that interaction between crypto and, and banks is very is very interesting nowadays, because in in the last year we've seen the explosion of of peer to peer transactions, right? So it's not like B two B or P two B, it's peer to peer, and where the users do not know each other. It's not like I've met you in the street. I know who you are. I know where you live. I checked your ID. I have a copy of your passport. In, in a digital world, this does not, that does not exist. And so where the complications could be, let's say a person sells an expensive piece of NFT, right? For Six six hundred thousand dollars, and and by the way, those are not like those are typical numbers. There are some very expensive digital, uh, you know, paintings out there. So, and he says, "Well, I just sold an expensive piece of uh, art, a digital NFT. I spent two thousand dollars when it was still cheap, and I want to pay tax on, on on the difference. What do I do?" And then you would ask him, "Well, do you know where the funds came from?" Because if you work with a bank, the bank will probably would want to know that, you know, the, the funds came from a clean source. And a lot of times a client cannot answer to you this like simple question where they come, what the funds came from, because they came from another digital wallet. And that digital wallet could, could be, uh, you know, somewhere in, in Iran or North Korea or in other sanctioned jurisdictions. So this is where it gets tricky. And, uh, and when you contact the bank, trying to explain a situation like, hey, I have a client, he wants to uh, complete a wire transfer he, to his bank account, but because the transaction was completed in, in a peer-to-peer -peer style, he can't really explain the source of funds. And to, the banker would listen to you in not knowing what to say. And we had those conversations multiple times with you know different banks in, in New York and other states. 
And and the answer is like, hey, we, we cannot guarantee you that once you deposit those funds that we will, we will not be sending out a SAR report. I'm like, well, that's interesting because if I'm an existing client in the bank before wiring the funds, you, you can tell me what what level of due diligence you will be using to you know to verify whether or not to file SAR or not to file. So that part is not clear to me when it comes to uh, digital assets and, and banking. So if you had a client that's just starting out in this market, this client is ready to create or ready to buy or ready to sell, how would you advise them to just start out of the gate in a way that facilitates compliance and facilitates reporting and facilitates, you know, tax reporting and tax compliance? Well, I would recommend to to operate only through platforms that are that are legitimate, right? We we want to know that that the platform through which a customer that a customer either buys or sells NFTs actually does whitelist all of the users on the platform. So, in other words, in order for me to participate as as a bidder or or seller on the platform. A platform needs to collect a copy of my uh, driver's license, right? They need, need to verify who I am. So just like, why don't you work through platforms that already do all the homework for you, as opposed to going onto the platform that that does doesn't do anything? So this way, you can have a clear record. Like, hey, I I purchased this uh, you know piece of digital art in in in, in 2021. Using this platform, the platform completed all the KYC and the email checks. You know, we see that the the, the seller of this uh, piece came from the United States. We know that the platform completed, uh, you know, their own due diligence on the seller. So, if there is a, ever a question from a banking institution or you know a FinCEN, you can have like a clear record of what happened in any given period of time, as opposed to uh, transacting on questionable platforms that do not have any record keeping whatsoever so that would be the first step so it sounds like the way the platform operates is very crucial to being able to do the kind of due diligence and the kind of compliance that ideally would occur in other words the platform makes all the difference in the world is that true would you say that is true. Like, well, it is true. Like, think of, uh, of like a high-end uh, art auction houses, like Sotheby's, right? Uh, like, if, if you're buying a piece of uh, art or antique from an established auction house, there are certain standards that an auction house would follow, right? They would probably do full due diligence on the item that's being sold. Like okay, what's the what's the title to this to this piece? Is it a, is it a stolen piece? Is it not a stolen piece? So they would have a title report, right? So in, in order for you to participate on the auction, you need to register with the auction house. So you have to submit your documents. You need to prove that whatever funds you are planning to use and completing the purchase are legitimate, right? I guess a respectable NFT marketplace would follow the the same principles. Support for this podcast is provided by the American Bar Association Tax Section. Are you looking to make valuable connections with government officials, academics, and tax professionals? ABA Tax Section membership provides you with opportunities year-round to engage and network in your area of practice. Members receive discounts on meetings, CLE, and publications, and membership also provides you with free, on-demand CLE and special members-only news and updates. Discover how membership can benefit you and join at ambar.org slash tax notes. That's ambar.org slash tax notes. Do you know whether or not some of these platforms, like for example, let's say you've got certain players in a marketplace that provide participants with tax compliance documents, let's say a 1099 or a W-2. Do some of these platforms help with that? Are you aware of any that help buyers and sellers on the platforms with their tax compliance? Actually, no, I haven't heard of that, no. But I can tell you that there are a lot of platforms, NFT marketplaces, some of them are good and some of them are really bad. (laughs) 
So, so when a client tells me that, hey, I uh, was trading on, on this in this marketplace, if, if they tell me the, the name of the marketplace, it can like immediately, it, it immediately raises like a red flag in my mind. I'm like, okay, it doesn't look good. You will have a problem, I, gar- I guarantee you. Okay, well, it's sort of a wrap up question. Any traps for the unwary? Anyone that you know happens to be tuning in and is interested in participating in the marketplace, have you got any words of advice? Well, I would say like a buyer beware, right? So if, if you're buying something expensive, like half a million dollar digital art, like think of it, how's it different than buying a house? So wouldn't you want to have a full due diligence on, on that piece of property that you're buying? Like, wouldn't you want to have like something in writing from the seller, you know, making representations that like, yes, I, I'm, I'm a legitimate seller, the, the title to this property is clean. I would also ask for representations that, hey, whatever NFT I'm buying is not a security because a lot of them could be securities, by the way. And if that's the case, then I'm stuck with an illiquid asset. So once again, everyone who, 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 who is looking to, to jump into this exciting uh, world of, of digital art, just be aware. Do you do you all due diligence? Don't follow the herd. Be very cautious uh, with how you handle your funds, to whom you send it. And if you are accepting a large sums of money from someone you've never met, I mean, that's, that's such suspicious on, on its own. We live in, in, in 2022. Like, we need to know who we're dealing with, especially if we live in the US, right? And I would recommend starting out, I like to call it the crypto Bible. So uh, there is a, a, a Department of Justice uh, cryptocurrency enforcement framework that, that DOJ released uh, last year. So it goes like line by line what, what users uh, should know about this exciting uh, world of digital currencies, like what they can and cannot do, like what are the, some of the you know, risky areas. So that would be a good start. For someone who's never done it before, and and certainly that's a good document for any like tax professional or legal practitioner to do you. Okay, well, thank you so much for being with us today. That was a fascinating and interesting discussion. Katie, thank you so much for having me. It's it's been a pleasure and an honor to be part of your podcast. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief, Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, four accounting professors examine reasonable compensation for S-Corps under Section 199 Cap A. Robert Rojas and Michael Pusey provide historical context for recent captive insurance developments. In Tax Notes State, Shale Shaw and Campbell McLaurin review California's taxation of non-residents regarding equity-based compensation. Scott Peterson examines factors that will affect sales tax policy in 2022, such as remote work, tax cuts, remote sellers and marketplaces, and investments in technology. In Tax Notes International, three KPMG practitioners warn of the extended limitations period for subpart F omissions and how it could affect a taxpayer's overall return. Three tax professionals compare the OECD's global minimum tax and guilty. In featured analysis, Robert Goulder asks why EU officials habitually decline to enforce EU data protection rules whenever FATCA is involved. And now, for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here's Tax Notes Federal Editor-in-Chief Ariel Greenblum. Thanks, Paige. I'm here with Professor Edward Zielinski, Morris and Annie Trackman, Professor of Law at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law of Yeshiva University, to discuss his Tax Notes Federal piece titled, Simplifying Income Tax Reporting for Americans Abroad. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Zelensky. Thank you for having me. To begin, can you give us a brief overview of your article? Yes, I am basically responding to a bill, H.R. 6057 which would require the IRS to simplify the tax forms for U.S. citizens living abroad 
And my argument is a simple one, and that is that such simplification is a good thing, but the IRS can do it on its own. It doesn't have to wait to be mandated by Congress. And an incidental benefit of simplifying some forms for foreign expatriates of the United States would also simplify matters for some U.S. citizens who live at home. Thanks. Where did this idea come from? Well, it came from a couple of places. In part, it came from the fact that I have spent the last several years thinking very hard about this question of where do people live for tax purposes? And particularly with COVID, this is now an even more dramatic question, both domestically, as many people find themselves in different places at different times of the years, as well as cross-border. So it's part of an underlying issue that I've been thinking about for many years. Then, as I say, this bill, a 6057, immediately provoked my response. And I guess at a third level, I'm trying to, as many people are today, conduct a reasonable dialogue with those with whom I disagree. I'm a strong supporter of citizenship-based taxation, but as I listen to the critics, I think one point that they raise that is absolutely fair is that our current reporting requirements are too complicated. So I in view my endorsement of 6057 and what it's trying to accomplish as an attempt in this very bitter environment to try to reach out at least in a small way to people with whom I disagree. Great. Now, before we let you go, where can listeners find you online? Listeners can find me uh, in any number of places. Uh, They can find me through the Cardoza website. Uh, They can find me, like all of the resources that we have for legal scholarship, Lexis, Westlaw, Bloomberg, and they can find me in Tax Notes, where I published a lot of stuff over the years. Thanks for joining us on the podcast, Professor Zelensky. Thanks for having me. You can find Professor Zelensky's article online at taxnotes.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tax Analysts, for more in-depth discussions on what's new and noteworthy in tax notes. Again, that's Tax Analysts with an S. Back to you, Dave. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at Tax Stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.